whom do you serve as executives, as leaders, as investors, innovators, advisors? Whom do you serve? The answer to this question was critical to London Business School's resilience during the pandemic. I'm offering you this question today because in my experience as a dean of London Business School, I've learned how it's essential not just to resilience, but to influence, to dominance, and eventually to thriving under disruption. Resilience first. When COVID hit at London Business School, we had to cancel so many student experiences. The classes on our campus in Dubai and in London, the international field trips. So truly challenging times. There was so much frustration and even at times anger. In one of my meetings with our students, there was a representative who stood up and said, Dean, it's on you to find the win-win. No, there was no win-win. I'm sure you experienced the same yourselves. This was a time of arbitrage of loss losses, dealing with allocating those losses, cutting costs, asking for salary sacrifices and more. And at that time, having a clear answer to this question, whom do we serve, proved essential to guide our decision and our efforts. And so the question is, at London Business School, whom do we serve? We are a charity, no owners, no shareholders. The governors, they come and go. The students, they do pay. They pay tuition to get a degree. But there's more to it, isn't it? I don't know of any student who has ever bought a degree from us to put it on the wall and bask in the glory of the framed diploma. Now, if you think about it from an economic perspective, at LBS, we have a monopoly power in the creation of LBS alumni. No one else can do that. And if you ask what is our most durable asset, it's also our alumni. Because once they're an alum, they're an alum for life. They cannot go to our competition and say, I got a degree from London Business School, can I pay your alumni fees? We're tied together. Their reputation is our reputation. As their dean, I wear a lapel pin, they might as well get a tattoo. So you see the response emerging, whom do we serve? At LBS, it starts with our alumni. And that was essential during the pandemic for us to decide what to focus on. So for example, when the pandemic hit and we had to go into lockdown in March 2020, we had 1,617 students who were on their way to graduate by July to become alumni by July. So our efforts went all out to make sure that by July, they had done all their degree requirements. At the same time, we were recruiting the next class. We serve our alumni. So we kept our admission process selective, even though we were under significant financial strain. Why? Because we need to uphold the reputation of our alumni. And then, of course, we learned very quickly during the pandemic that there were ways in which we could serve, support our alumni during these difficult times with content and connections for the new normal we were in. And today, the answer to that same question, whom do we serve, is helping us grow our influence. Why? Because we've learned during the pandemic it was actually quite a catalyst to help us understand how is it we can provide content and connection to help our alumni advance their careers, support their entrepreneurial ventures, and transform their organizations. Because our influence is their influence. And as an example, I'll use a local, local organization here in Delhi. Some of you might know Dharma Life. Dharma Life is dedicated to improving life in rural India by giving low-income households access to critical products and services. Down my life, Google them. Not now. But when you Google them, you will find out that they are very clear as to whom they serve. They serve a network of entrepreneurs whom they select, they train, they support to be change makers in their villages. And today, Down my life has a network of 17,500 entrepreneurs were active in more than 50,000 villages across 14 states in India. 
that's influence. From influence to dominance, I'll get insight from another organization that is known to all of you in India that is also led by an alumnus of London Business School. And that is the Aditya Birla Group, led by Kumar Mangalam Birla. I don't know if you know this, but he got an MBA from us in 1993, shortly thereafter took over the group. And he's led the group with the same commitment to serving society that his great grandfather imparted on him, Sri Jaiki Birla. You might remember some of you from him that he talked about way before corporate social responsibility was something. He talked about ownership in trust of society, about entrepreneurs as custodians of societal wealth. And today as his dean, when I see what Kumar is doing, I can't help but notice that he remains very much animated, fueled by this desire to do well for society, to serve society through high-performing businesses, educational institutions, and many philanthropic endeavors. So if that's resilience and influence and dominance, how I define thriving? Thriving is, is when those whom we serve, they join in to serve with us. And that linear path of resilience, influence, dominance becomes a self-reinforcing loop. Whom you serve, joined in to serve with you. What would happen in your organization or what is already happening in your organization if those whom you serve are serving with you? At LBS, what you would see is our alumni helping us recruit students, participate in classes, host visits, and with their philanthropy, funding scholarships and innovation and research and so many more. And there again, Kumar Birla is an example for us. Because he funds one of our most generous scholarships for 10 bright, bright minds from around the world to join our school every year. And he does it in the most beautiful way. With an endowment gift in the name of and in gratitude to his grandfather, B.K. Birla. And as Dean of LBS, I couldn't be more proud to be associated with this manifestation of gratitude of Kumar toward his grandfather. And there may be lies inspiration to push my question one step further. Whom do you serve and in gratitude to whom? And what I offer to you is that having a clear answer to this question can only help you with resilience, influence, dominance, and inspiring others to join in with you so that they thrive with you. Whom do you serve and in gratitude to whom? As the Dean of LBS, I serve our employees, starting with my senior management team. And I'm grateful to them because they gave me the opportunity to be here today and go around the world and inspire current and future leaders of the world, people like you. Whom do you serve and in gratitude to whom? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you. So, Dean Transfer, that was a wonderful articulation of mm -hmm. thriving under disruption by uh -huh. putting the focus on whom you serve. I'd like to look at disruption from a higher education and executive education standpoint. Uh -huh. so as we know, higher education has been at the heart of a debate uh, for a long time pre-COVID and now post-COVID that debate is even sharper. And the debate is about the accessibility and affordability of excellence in higher education. Talk to us about how some of these new trends in higher education uh -huh. technology have disrupted schools like London Business School uh -huh. during and before COVID and how you cope and how you thrive. So you won't be surprised, I'll start from my question. So as, as a school, it's very clear how much our alumni value their network and the selectivity of it. And so for us, whom do we serve is to take advantage of the disruption, to use technology to serve them through the rest of their life. 
and, and to get ourselves into a position whereby at any point in time we can give them those content and connections. So it's, it's not like you know, on Amazon, they tell you you bought this book, you might like that book. No, it's a lot more saying given where you are today in your career, we think two years from now you'll be there. Here's how we can help you speed up the transition with content and, and with connection. The, the bigger trend I think that's at play in the world for all of us is because our lives have become longer, but the life of organization has got shorter. So we will all live longer than our organizations anyway. And so this idea that you're born, you go to education, you work, right, that's over. And, and what I see is happening, and, and you're doing that yourself, is, is an opportunity for people to, to complement their education, not just with the big chunky things like degree programs, but over the course of their life, getting a little bite-sized and then the question is, who is going to do the curation? And you're trying to do that, and we're trying to do this for our alum alumni. But how do you see innovation in higher education taking its course over the next few years? We've seen uh -huh. you know, companies like Times Pro come in, yes. become online program managers, mm -hmm. bring you back consumer insight, take, uh -huh. your, take your excellence in bite-sized packets yeah. to the learner. But how do you see the next decade of innovation and disruption? So th there's one element I can see, and you're an actor of it, and there's one, it's a big question for all of us. So what I can see is actors like you, who are using technology and data, and very soon, if not already, artificial intelligence, to really bring great insight to the masses. And that's really important in a country like India, particularly because there's such motivation for education here that you want to make it available. So that, that I can see, and we're all actors of that, one way or another, and being pushed in a way, the legacy schools by innovators like you. The, the, what I don't see is, in this future world, who is going to support academic research? And that's a big problem, and I'll give you just one reason. Today, if I look at LBS faculty, we were ranked recently as the number two faculty in the world for research on the sustainable development goals. That's not because a few years ago our faculty or the dean said do this. That's because we are faculty who care about impact. <laughs> 15 years ago they were working on some obscure mathematical issues about how do you model the short term versus the long term to understand sustainability. Thank goodness at the time they had the freedom to do this. Who is tomorrow going to give the freedom to those selected individuals to explore obscure questions? So that 15 years from now we have academics who are relevant. And, and that to me is a big question for all of us as human beings, is who is funding fundamental research? And to bring to your uh, point about impact, you've written and spoken about the role of London Business School, uh -huh. and you've spoken in terms of a very catchy phrase called Impact Square. Impact Square, Talk yes. about that. So, so what happened is, when I became Dean of LBS, we articulated our purpose as having a profound impact on the way the world does business. And as a new dean, I went around the world and I met with our alumni, I listened to our faculty, to my colleagues, and I realized there was something missing in the sentence. Because people were not just worried about an impact on the way they were this business, but people were worried about the way business impacts the world. So in the speech I said, you know, I think we are about having a profound impact on the way they were this business, and on the way business impacts the world. So if you do the math of that sentence, a bit long, but it's about <laughs> profound impact, and then it's profound impact on impact, that's impact squared. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to do. Very profound nice. impact and impact squared. It, but I hope you understand, that it is so important that business schools like ours worry about the impact business has on the world. And part of it is the conversation that we are having here. And when it comes to impact, we cannot get away from that subject without talking about the impact of government on uh -huh. everything that we do in higher yep. education. And in India, we have just gone through it. The government the just buzzed you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, we'll take this one last question and then maybe yeah. open it up to sure. the audience. In India now, we just have the new education policy. Yes. And the government is talking about opening up uh -huh. Indian shores to foreign universities uh -huh. and institutions such as yourself to come in and step up shop. So do we see LBS setting up shop quickly in India? What's your, what's your take on this? So, so we are very focused on our strategies to serve our alumni. We do that from a London hub. We have about a thousand alumni uh, here. We can serve them from London. I had a delightful evening with them two nights ago here. Uh, so we have no plans uh, to come in here. Can I say, 
it was interesting to see this policy, particularly because in India there are amazing universities already. Mm -hmm. The evidence I have firsthand is the quality of the students who come from India into London Business School. So if I had a chance to, to say a word to the policy makers, I would encourage them to focus on, in India, research, get research to happen here. How do you fund that? Mm -hmm. And the other question that I see is the big gap in India is the training of professors. Mm -hmm. Because what I observe is you are not to do education, but you don't have enough faculty members to run those universities and those schools. Same old problem of affordability and access and quality training. Yeah, Wonderful yeah the government can focus on that. Maybe the government should focus on serving the faculty uh, so that they can serve the students. Great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you so much. Thank you.